Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, musicians, and comedians that perform here and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what makes our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Don Davis Womack. Hello, Laughers. Can you believe it? We've made it to 100 episodes. To celebrate this milestone, we've put together a highlight reel for you featuring the comedians we've interviewed on this podcast since its launch. Plus, we also have a very fun Valley discount for you. So sit back, relax, laugh, and enjoy the show. Are you planning to bring a partner or a date? We ain't dancing together, brother. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's totally understood. Totally understood. Make sure you have some single ladies I'm in there. Sure you, I'm pretty sure you're a great lead, but I'll, I'll, I'll pass. I'll, yeah, I'll pass at this particular rodeo if you don't. Understood. Understood. But you both are more than welcome to bring a date. And I'm sure yeah, I had you. one planned, so now I got to plan another one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> dog, you trying to get me in trouble, dog. You trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Who are you taking, Travis? Who are you taking? Right. Now's, now's going to be broadcast out there. Like, oh, who is he taking to the prom? We, we got to know. Like, <laughs> oh, man. The Roomba prom. You know the one they was talking about. They're going to the Roomba with the prom clothes. Oh, but, man. yeah, I, uh, I may have a dance partner. I might just, you know, I ain't gonna have one. I'm putting out there now. <laughs> okay. That's fine. You don't have that to. That should be provided. <laughs> right. <laughs> Part <laughs> of the contract, right? <laughs> just dancing, though. Just dancing, though. Yeah, just, just dan- <laughs> the dancing portion of the evening. You can, you can now select your contractual uh, obligated dance partner. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, that's so good. So, yeah, as Jake was saying, our next game is going to be press conference, and that is going to include Stephen, Cat, Abigail, and Chase. Now, Chase is going to be a celebrity, except he isn't going to know what celebrity he is. So, Chase, if you would like to mute and just turn off your volume so we can go ahead and pick a celebrity for you, we'll let you know when you can come back in. So, basically, Chase is a celebrity in a press conference, and... uh, Stephen, Cat, and Abigail are going to be asking him questions about a task that he performed, except he doesn't know what the task is himself either. So he's going to be guessing what celebrity he is and what task he is doing. So if I could get some suggestions for a celebrity for Chase. Angelina Jolie. Neil Armstrong. (laughs) Neil Armstrong. Armstrong. Okay, Chase is going to be Neil Armstrong, and the task that he he has performed is can I get some suggestions for that? Walk the dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Neil Armstrong uh, was walking his dog and uh, I will go ahead and uh, get Chase back in here and we will go ahead and get the game started here. I'm back. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, Thank you for coming to my uh, conference, and I'm just glad to answer all your questions and just ask away. It's great to be here. Yes, I just want to say it's just such an honor to be in front of a legend. Um, I always grew up looking up at you. You're a huge role model. Thank you for everything you've done. Thank you for that. I I appreciate people looking up to me, and I'm just glad that I can be the person who uh, is the role model for you. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Chuck Daly, News Bailey. Uh, as, as someone who did something so monumental for uh, mankind, do you think that having having us report on this is a bit mundane? Like, have you peaked at this point, gone as far as you could? I don't think it's mundane enough. I think there is a <laughs> lot more to do, and that I cannot wait for the next steps and uh, have my followers. Yes, the uh, woman in the back. Hi. Um. I just want to say, like, I'm, like, a huge fan. I've had a crush on you since I was, like, a little girl. Um, I just want to say that, like, your one big step, like, really inspired me. And, like, you you were the first, you know? And that's just, that's just amazing to me. I, I mean, I, I agree. I was the first and um, definitely not the last. There will be more after me. I'm just glad that I could have um, stepped uh, step foot, the first foot forward. 
Yes. Yes, sir. I'm here with the Chicago Sun, and we just wanted to say, um, is there a reason why you um, dislike cats um, or fish? I, I don't know. We were very shocked to find out that you had a favorite um, pet. Um, well, I just, I just don't think they uh, smell very good, and I'm more of a dog person myself, if I will say so myself. Uh, hello, uh, Tim Bailey, News Weekly. Um, now, how often do you do this with your dog? I mean, it's a pretty r regular activity, but how often are you uh, doing it for their health? Oh, at least once a year, I would say. Oh. <laughs> At least, at least, at least, at uh, least. Fair enough. Thank you. I would say every time the uh, Earth goes around the sun, there's at least one time that I do that. I'm a big space guy. Um, quick question. Um, you said once a year. Um, most vet veterinarians say that you should probably do this more than once a year. In fact, it's more beneficial for your pet's health if you do it daily. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, it does not seem like it, but I will speak for him. Uh, I think that it is imperative that um, people realize that some things are fake, just like veterinarians. And that is why I, uh, Lance Armstrong, uh, or Neil Armstrong, uh, was the first man to be on the moon and walk my dog. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, nice. Nailed it. We get asked a lot the question, you know, what do you do? You say comedian. They find that out. What's the next thing they often say? Tell me a joke. Tell me a joke. Yeah, tell me a joke. So I'd love to hear from each of you how you respond to that question. And we'll we'll start with you, Christopher. How do you respond to that? Or do you have a few different responses? Um, I have a few go-tos. Um, and for me, it's easy because I got the one liner. So if I, it's yeah. really not a pain for me. I can do it like as I'm sprinting away from the maintenance. But uh, <laughs> usually I go for like my worst puns. Um, so my two go-to responses right now are, um, I just bought a jacket for the next time I go hiking. It's my trailblazer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Uh, I accidentally put the wrong dressing on my salad been a regret. <laughs> <laughs> I, prefer, prefer. I like both nice. of those. Very nice. Very, Very nice. Good job, Chris. Clap for that one. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. How about you, Mike? How do you how do you approach that? <laughs> um that's <laughs> that's when I realized that I apparently have no jokes. Like I just have <laughs> I don't know how that works, but like every single time I'm like, and I keep I keep telling myself. And this is for a decade <laughs> that I need to like have a few go tos like Christopher does. Um, but I, I usually just end up being like, well, you're going to have to come see me. Yeah. I do have like a few one liners, but for some reason, a lot of times they just they, they work live, but they just get blank stares when I do them one on one. As I usually tell people like it doesn't really translate one on one for some reason. Mm -hmm. I'm really not that funny, like person to person <laughs> very often, but. I have like a few one-liners that I go to. Like, uh, if I uh, if I could choose one superpower, I'd probably go with China. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. I like that one. Good one. I like that. Good one. Yeah. Oh, a, new, a new one that I came up with that I'm very proud of. I haven't really gotten it to test to test yet. But uh, anybody have cheap parents? Anybody grow up with uh, Playgos and public <laughs> television? Anybody? <laughs> Yeah. I, uh, I remember one year around Halloween, I, uh, I told my mom I'd like to be a skeleton. And she was like, well, can't you just be patient? <laughs> <laughs> eventually, you're going to be spending a lot of Halloweens as a skeleton. Why don't you enjoy your flesh? While you're <laughs> um, I like that one. I, love I like that, that one, too. That. That's, That's so great, Mike. Yes. I love it. Those are great. How about you, Cornbread? How do you well, feel about that? Uh, I have a a way of doing it that seems like I I'll just do it. You you asked me to tell you the joke. We just met, Don. Yeah. Oh, tell me a joke, Cornbread. Well, Don, I would, but you know, we got Christopher and Mike here and they don't know me very well. You see, when I start talking, people just naturally assume things about me. Like like Mike, I can sort of tell by the expression on his face. He's thinking right now to himself, he's saying, This old boy's illiterate. 
I'll have you know, my, my parents was married three weeks before I was born, so I'm not illiterate at all, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and now, now Christopher's thinking his parents was married three weeks before he was born. They, how could they even know each other? Listen, Chris, they've been first cousins all their life. They didn't have to be married <laughs> a long time. You know? <laughs> You know, they, they, you know, now y'all are judging me. I can tell, I can tell Don's got that judgy face on <laughs> because I'm inbred, you know, but, but, you know, I, Hey, inbred people have certain advantages. I was born with six toes on each foot. So I was first kid in our trailer park where I could count to 22. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I do something like that. And, but here's the key. When they ask for a joke, they've asked me for a favor. They now owe me a favor. I keep business cards with me all the time. I, I, I hand them two or three business cards. I say, hey, uh, you've heard my jokes now. Do me a favor. Pass these along to, you know, if it's, if it's a person, it's a business person, you know, pass these along to your HR department. Uh, I do motivational speaking and corporate. Uh, if it's a Christian, I say, you know, hey, could you pass these along to your pastor? And uh, I usually will get, just by passing out business cards, I'll get 10 to 12 shows a year. You know, say I pick up, you know, three to $500 per show, you know, for, you know, I pass out usually about a thousand business cards a year. Cost me about 25, 35 bucks. I'll easily pick up three to $4,000 in shows off those business cards. So when people ask for, a joke. I give them a little bit about, uh, you know, being inbred, being, you know, illiterate, whatever, give them some business cards and invariably I get some shows. That's brilliant. That's I'm stealing brilliant. all of cornbread's ideas. Tonight. <laughs> some good ones. Hey, laughers, Tisha here. You know, what goes great with this podcast? Free popsters gourmet popcorn. We're so excited to sponsor this podcast, highlighting some of the most wonderful people in the Shenandoah Valley. To show our love for you, laughers, we're giving you 15% off today at prepopsterous.com. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S dot com. Use promo code LAUGH15. My next question for everybody in the newlywed game. Uh, this one might be more of a bombshell for, and I, you know, and I, and I'm, again, I'm staying in the guest bedroom of Don and Chris. So when I get here, so I just hope that things can be resolved by then after this question <laughs> is what was the first behavior that had to be addressed for the couple when you got married? Like, so at some point after the wedding, <laughs> at some point after the honeymoon, I assume, or the honeymoon phase, even I assume after that, what was like the first thing? So you got the stereotype type of the like okay he leaves his socks on the floor or or something like that what what along those lines or it could be more deep and philosophical if need be what was the first behavior from either side from so mm -hmm. it's just like essentially one per couple but we'll ask if you guys remember it the same way what was the first behavior that had to be addressed after marriage uh, after the wedding dang jared like <laughs> yeah that's why I was like, I wanted to do something that might actually kind of twist it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I will gladly go first. Do it, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it is the first behavior that had to be addressed, and it was addressed for some years, is leaving the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, there's a lot yeah. of candidates and that's a really good one. Yeah, it, but I thought it was because um, it still is addressed. The noises yeah. I make while I'm eating. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Actually, he makes noises. So I hum. He hums. And so mm. at, at uh, when we do family reunions or holiday gatherings or, like, or, or you know, we go out somewhere. You want to sit next to your husband? I'm like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know this oh, tune. Great. Yeah. What does the humming look like? Like you do it subconsciously or you do it on it. purpose? I, I, no. I swear it's a different frequency that only she hears. Yeah. And I will, I will do it. Demonstration. Are you ready? Oh, oh boy. Yes. Right, here yes. we go. Here we go. <laughs> no way. That's like, good. And I go, you can't hear that? You seriously can't hear that? <laughs> 
Did that not come out pre-wedding or did you just ignore it? You know, I think I took her out to eat. I, in fairness to me, in I took her to lots of dinners when we were dating. In Baltimore. So uh, let's yeah, give that's some true. context of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. misrepresentation of sound. I married misrepresentation. Of I'm going to be leaning into Annalise's jaw when she eats now. I think <laughs> yeah. I want to make sure we can get this yeah. in the bud. Yeah, you need to. Yeah. What this, is like a, this is a pre-wedding conversation for me, I think. Yeah. Yes. I love these like this like these notes you're taking. And you deserve it, Jared, because those are some like therapist level. That was a therapist level question. So <laughs> Well, yeah. I'm glad I get to be that therapist in your life now. So what are your answers? <laughs> My first answer is what is Annalise's number. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just playing. I just tell her, I just tell her, good job. So, okay. I think, but I'm not sure if I said it right after we got married. No, no. I'm going to, this is what I'm going with because on our honeymoon, so you know the timeline ad adds up. Just, we're at the bar. And because I don't know, I, cause I didn't know, I didn't know what the deal was with just j how jewelry is taken care of. And I was like, one day I was like, Jesse, let's take off our rings so that we didn't lose our rings. Don't worry. That's not how this ends. I don't, I don't want to get a lot of sand in them. You know, give me these fresh, his beautiful fresh band and my, you know, my, my engagement ring with my band that I just had put on two days ago. And we're at a bar one night at this place we were so excited to go where it's like so it's like one of the highest points uh, on St. Thomas and there's a restaurant up there you have to take a ski lift to get up there so 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 excited go sit up at the bar and I have nightmares of the just cutest blonde just most beautiful bartender in the entire world and when Jesse sat down, she zoned in on him on my honeymoon after I locked it down. <laughs> I just locked it down and signed papers. And this girl couldn't get over the, uh, the Jesse was wearing a uh, Queens of the Stone Age, um, uh, the, uh, Da, 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 album called Villains. And she just loves the album and like, trust me, I'm not exaggerating. That girl, like, I was just, like, frozen. Now, Jesse's defense, Jesse did nothing wrong, but he didn't do what I wanted him to do, which was to say, stand up and be like, this is my wife. She is my queen. Get away from me. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I hate, like, you were the most unattractive person in the world. Instead, he was just, like, nice and confused and polite. And I, he, he, uh, he made sure he took care of me that night. Uh, I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be, he was just nice to me. Um, I mean, come on, it was our honeymoon. It's but, a G13 clean cut. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, I. Medical that, nipples. Yeah. yeah. He, no, I really mean just my emotions. He was like, Sarah, I just, that was just unusual. And we didn't have our, you know, but I also regret not saying something to her. Um, and, <laughs> and, and really I shouldn't, I shouldn't still be mad at this person, <laughs> but I am. And so I just said to Jesse, I said, Hey, in the future, in that situation, like just do something, <laughs> stand up and declare your love for me. <laughs> and it, but kind of synonymous to that. Just like try to deflect it a little bit more. Cause, um, I don't want to murder anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesse, have you gotten a chance to declare your love in public uh, in defense of another woman's affection since then? No, because I don't believe it ever happens. Uh, <laughs> you were you were living in Richmond, and now you're in D.C. You're based out of there. And what has that allowed you to do that you weren't able to do before? Oh man, it's it's been great for spending uh, more money. Um, <laughs> it's allowed me to find out how little I actually need to live on a month. <laughs> it's, been, it's been good for that. Uh, no, it's been uh, it's been great. And uh, now that stuff's opening back up in DC, uh, like if I'm not on the road or I'm not doing a paid gig, I can do two or three open mics in a night. Uh, it's helped me to network with more comedians because we have more headliners coming through DC and it's just made it so that like I was already driving really far on the reverse from Richmond to DC. Cause I was coming up 
up there like once or twice a month anyway. And now it's like, cool, I can still take gigs in Richmond. I'm closer to New York. I'm going to make my first trip to New York for comedy later this year. Uh, it's just really allowed me to, um, diversify where I'm going and, and, and to make some new connections. And it's really, I think, uh, I think it's been really good for my comedy. Like, I think it's really helped me out a lot. That sounds good. And maybe, you know, a fitness program because you're eating. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you would think that. <laughs> you, would, you would hope. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll go to you, Joel. Oh, <laughs> right, same way. To, okay. No, no, we'll go to you, Joel. We have a question for you. You have hosted what's called Right Tank Club and maybe has had some other names, but we, we fondly know it as right fondly know it as Right Ten Club. And that's online writing club for comics that you started during COVID. I've been a part of that and I'm very thankful for this experience. Can you share with our laughers what that is all about and where it is today? Yeah, the Write 10 Club started as a way for me to write every day and be held accountable to do it during the pandemic. I mean, it all started with me. I wasn't writing and I was like, oh man, I need to, I need some sort of motivation. So I started live streaming my writing and then people were joining and then people were joining and asking what I'm writing about. And then people were joining and then writing with me. So I was like, oh, this could become like a, a like a community event, really, for people to write new jokes. So it all grew from me just wanting to write more, but needing some sort of accountability. And to now it for I mean, for over a year, I think we ended up I don't remember how many days it was over 400 days straight. We wow. did the right 10 club. Um, a daily live stream at 10 a.m. And then now it's still a daily club, but it's a live stream once a week now. So the live stream is only on Mondays now, but there is still a daily word of the day to be a writing prompt for people to write a joke. So yeah. it's been growing and evolving, but it really has become something I've been able to, I mean, Don, I mean, we were connected before, but it's really created relationships, you know, with comics around the world. So it's been very rewarding. Yeah. So how does the format work? I'm, I know, but how does, yeah, format, yeah. <laughs> we get a, we get a random word every day, which was so funny that a member of the, the community actually created this random word generator. He's like a coder or something. So he coded us a word generator to where I could just like click a button and it would generate a word. And that would be the word that we wrote that day. Um, so you get a word and then you get 10 minutes to write a joke using that word. And then I'll read them out loud and give feedback. And then we'll vote. We'll like people will post their jokes and people will like the ones that they're voting for. And then the winner gets a, a fancy meme. Yes. A fancy meme of their joke. So everybody wins. That's right. I got a, I got a winning meme. Got I'm only in like two. It's very embarrassing. <laughs> People were like, you're running this? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm losing on purpose. All right. Yeah, that's right. You're encouraging other people by you know <laughs> taking one for the team and allowing it, others to shine. <laughs> and it's been a good outlet for people who have thought about pursuing comedy, but never have as well. Like I've seen several people who are like, I always wanted to try it. And then I tried to write 10 club and then it inspired me to do a Zoom show. And now I'm doing live shows. Like yeah. I've seen people uh, follow it that way too, to actually start pursuing comedy. Yeah. Actually over COVID, my husband, Chris, who would listen a lot of times and give some input, <laughs> you know, on, on the right 10 and now he's doing stand up. So <laughs> <Cool. laughs> <That's> crazy. <laughs> That's so cool. It is cool. Wow. It, uh, writing's a big part of our craft and everybody seems to go about it a little different. And also it seems to evolve somewhat for, Comics, can you each speak on your own writing process? Can we start with you, Winston? Can you? Yeah, that's a, that? uh, but before that, I will say it's like I, I think that the 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 right ten thing is like it, that was perfect for people during this pandemic, Joel. Like it's kind of it, it's it's insane how many people that I've met since COVID has happened that like know your right ten thing. Like it's it's it's. 
like it, dude, it's insane where it's like, uh, <laughs> like, lo- like local comics in Richmond who are uh, a couple that were like newer and like it gave them the courage to want to do it. And a couple people that have been doing it for a little while before the pandemic, they're just be, they'll just name drop you in conversation. And it's just so, it, it, and it's just a weird thing to just be like, yeah, I know that guy. Uh, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. So you made like, I think you may, I don't know. I don't know if you know how like wide reaching a bit of an impact you've had as far as like, Cause I, 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 I've heard of quite a few people that have like, uh, that either helped them get into comedy or really held them accountable, um, to do the writing thing. So I thought I'd share that. Cause I thought, so someone said, it, and I, and I literally, I was so glad that this was today. Cause someone uh, said your name last night at a comedy show that I was doing. They're just what? like, yeah, I was doing the right thing. I was like, oh, it's just like, geez. I was like, I'm doing the podcast. I got tomorrow. So. <laughs> wow. I need to show this to my wife. Yeah. I feel like, <laughs> I'm like, Look, honey, it's, it's working. It's working. <laughs> Give him a break. <laughs> She's like, oh, does Georgia Power take jokes? Is that how, <laughs> exactly. I, is that how bills work now? <laughs> yeah. You get, yeah, you get electric in 10 minute increments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you saying that, Winston. Yeah, that's so cool to hear. Nikki, you are a mother of five boys. Does this inspire your material? And how do you balance home life with your comedy? Um, my family knows everything is material. Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh. They they know everything is open for discussion. Everything is open to be mocked. They know um, <laughs> that I will use any and everything for my comedy. Uh, I think that does help us with the balance because when they start doing crazy stuff, I'm like, oh, I'll stop in the middle of an argument and be like, oh, let me write that down. They'll be like, mom. <laughs> You set me up for this, so it's going to have to be used. So, you know, they're getting used to it now. It was much funnier when they were little because they said the craziest things. But now um, that they're getting older, I have to, um, you know, adjust because, you know, growing boys, some things, you know, we want to keep it clean, but some things we just feel like... That down. So yeah. I kind of like everybody knows where we stand when it comes to stuff that comes to my comedy. That's so. really great. What are the ages of your boys? Uh, my oldest is 23 and my youngest is eight. OK, wow. That's yeah. So you probably have some sibling material as well, since they're yeah. five boys. There's a lot of testosterone in that house. Yeah, my eight year old, I call him the informant. But as he's getting older, <laughs> You know, I have to up my ante because sometimes he can be bought off by his brothers. So it's, now he's like up for the highest bidder to get. How in. does he get bought off by his brothers? Uh, he likes cookies. So um, <laughs> <laughs> now that his older brothers are old enough to have jobs because I have 17, 16 and 14. So, you know, they have little odd jobs. So, they, you know, they, they'll buy him snacks or candy to, you know, be to keep him quiet. So. It's now he's up for that. It's better. Okay. And what has been his biggest take take home prize there? Is it um, um, cookies or? I have a son who works at Burger King. So now okay. Okay. chicken nuggets are his thing. Like if he comes home with a 10 piece chicken nugget, he is, he is bought out. Like you can't stop that. <laughs> PT, you performed at the White House. Tell us how that happened and what was the experience like? Um. So in reverse order, it was great. Um, and it came about, uh, I think the second year I was doing comedy, it came through, the opportunity came through uh, ASAP, the Armed Services Arts uh, Partnership. Is that ASAP? ASAP. Armed Services Arts, yeah. Um, uh, and it was, they, it was the end of Obama's tenure, um, his okay. second term. And, um, it was just like, hey, let's let's do a a comedy show with veteran comics. <laughs> so all the vets that work in the White House were like invited to the show, and it was great, and it was an honor to be selected. Um, and is I mean, mind blown, right? And I just yeah. started doing comedy, and I have this opportunity to do um, a show at the White House, so. It was did great. You, did you get a picture up with Obama? Do you have a picture? Uh, unfortunately not, because okay. he was entertaining the prime minister from somewhere, uh, okay. him and his wife. So uh, now President Biden was supposed to be the MC. 
Um, and he decided last minute to go on the campaign trail for uh, Hillary. And okay. in retrospect, he could have he could have stayed and did the comedy show because she didn't win anyway. So he could have <laughs> just been there with us. And that would have been a photo op, right? I'm like, oh, I got him because he's the president now. So I was like, yo, I got a picture with the vice president, yeah. now the president. So what was he anyway. thinking making that decision? <laughs> I know, right? It's, I would have made a different call. That's all. I- <laughs> If you could invite five comedians to a dinner party at your home, dead or alive, who would be seated at your table? Leslie, we'll start with you. Okay. John Christ. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Trey Kennedy. uh, Jerry Lewis. All right. Um, Yeah. I don't know why they all white men. I just thought about that. But anyway, um, (laughs) <laughs> uh, let's see. You said two more. Yeah. Big Daddy laugh a lot. If anybody uh, don't anybody know who he is, y'all gotta look him up. Yeah. Uh, Big Daddy laugh a lot. And um, man, the fifth one's hard. I don't know. Okay. Um, I'd say uh, Ellen DeGeneres. Oh, there you go. All right. Got some female representation in there. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. How about you, Lamont? Oh, uh, let me say, let me go down my line. No, I, I would have <laughs> yeah. Dave Chappelle. Nice. Seinfeld. Yes. Stephen Wright. Oh, nice. Mitch Hamburg, which is not living, but he was hilarious very then, good one-liner yeah uh and then i'll throw uh, michael jr in there he's funny as well oh very I like that. funny guy yeah that's a fun table too that's good mm-hmm. how about you wendy well first of all i had to make sure everybody didn't, didn't had their vaccines or their covid tests you know <laughs> before they i invite them to my house <laughs> uh but after they, they have tested negative they welcome to come i would welcome Sin bad because that's something I always oh. wanted. I wanted to sin very badly. Yes. <laughs> oh, sin bad. Uh, <laughs> then we got well, Wanda Sykes. Oh yeah. Whoopi Goldberg. Woo. Uh, and then, like um, Leslie said, Ellen. I love me some Ellen. Ellen DeGeneres. And then Jackie Mom's maybe. <laughs> oh wow that's a great yeah. table i love i would like to be seated at any one of those tables that's fabulous i love those answers are great now here's the next question if you could get if you were stuck on a deserted island to survive with one of the people at that table who would you pick and what one item would you insist that they bring Leslie. <laughs> I would say, uh, oh man, I would say of the people I mentioned, Big Daddy laughs a lot. Oh yeah. And that he bring, could it be a person or does it have to be a thing? I'm going to leave it up to you. In his Korea. daughter, who is awesome. I love her. I met his youngest daughter just recently at a show we did together, and she's awesome. So he had to bring his little girl. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. Which I did see that same show uh, that he yeah. was on. And he is hilarious. You are right about that. So yes. I get it. I see it. I'm totally with yeah, it. Yeah, he's very hilarious. Yeah, you're very hilarious. How about you, Lamont? I would, uh, I would have Dave Chappelle. And the item, since we're stuck on the island, uh, a pen. So we can write jokes. So when I get out of the <laughs> island, I will be much better than I am right now. <laughs> I will write, write a whole bunch of jokes and I get all that information from Dave. Okay, that's good. That's taking advantage of the situation. I yeah. like that. Okay. Like where you had to take them off. I'll take notes on my clothes if we don't have nothing else to write on. I was gonna, get, I was gonna ask that next, so you beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how about you, Wendy? Well, you know, being the single person that I am, I would have to invite the man that's in my lineup, and uh, so that would be Sinbad. And uh, um, I would have him to the bring it. 
his divorce papers. So <laughs> be free to do whatever. Amen. That is all. <laughs> if you were Jerry Seinfeld and could pick up a comic in a cool sports car, spend the day with them to pick their brain and talk shop about comedy, who would you pick and why? Patrick. That is such a hard question. Right. I, um, <laughs> like I, I want to say Norm Macdonald, but at the the uh, slow rate which he speaks, I'd only really get like a third of a day out of him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like just like it, it would be. I would I would need a week to really feel like I like gained much from the guy. Uh, honestly, I think that it'd be really cool to talk to uh, Jim Carrey mm. for the reason of which is that. His, if you watch his standup that he did like 20, 25 years ago, where he's wearing a bunch of crazy colored shirts and all that, and he goes on stage, and by the end of it, I mean, he's like dripping sweat. And I, I wish I could know what, the, what, the, what that uh, particular act was called, but I think about him, and same with like Chris Tucker too, as like two dudes who had the potential to be like killer stand up comedians, and then Hollywood found them and they became actors, you know? And I would like really love to talk to, uh, to, um, Jim Carrey, just about, you know, his early standup. I think that that would be really cool. Kind of find out like how he felt, you know, his career could evolve, what he maybe thought would have, you know, gone differently if he had never made it into movies because he was just so funny on stage and so natural and, and still his crazy self, which is, you know, different. You know, I think he'd be really cool. Yeah. I think it'd be fun to do someone like really crazy and like weird, like, like, especially if I'm Jerry Seinfeld, I'm not myself. I'd love to pick up like Gallagher and just like oh, yeah. go on a joyride and smash like mailboxes with his hair. I think that'd be good. That is so Paige right now. And I'm loving this answer. <laughs> and asking him about, asking him about his process is like, so what's your process? It's like, well, I go, I go, I buy a watermelon and I just bash it with a hammer. <laughs> wow. Because that's a thing, you know? Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, I would agree with you on Gallagher, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, 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 do, I think I never met him, but yeah. I was connected to him in one way. Uh, my first ex-girlfriend that I had friends years ago, her grandfather was a huge Gallagher fan. <laughs> yeah. He uh, died. of uh, Her grandfather died of cancer when he was in on in the hospital bed, basically his deathbed. I called Gallagher's agent. And I said, if you could, could you send a signed headshot to her grandfather? Gave him the address. It was there the next day. Oh, he, had, oh. he had it on his nightstand beside his bed when he passed. Oh, now I have I love goosebumps. That. Yeah. That's and they wonderful. still have that picture. She's, my, my friend still has that picture. What a heartwarming story. Yeah. I know. I love Gallagher, but now I'm more in love with him. Yeah, it was, it was cool. He's going to look at his split, signed specifically to him. I love it. So cool. It was cool. What should an audience expect when they see you perform? What's your material about? Well, my material is primarily about life. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, because most people don't realize that truth is funnier than fiction. I mean, you can look at any topic that goes on in your life that you may think is so dramatic and so devastating and find something to laugh about it. I mean, you may not get it right at the moment, but after a while, you know, when you come to grips with the situation, you can sit back and laugh about it. I mean, given, you know, we always tend to put a little flavoring on the experience but, you know, <laughs> you know, but, you know, but at the end of the day um it's life i talk about my family i talk about my ex-wife i talk about my children i talk about my weight because i'm a big guy but i'm working on that soon i'm gonna be formally a big guy so <laughs> that's gonna be great new material i can't wait to hear about I'm that <laughs> I'm getting it ready right now. Because <laughs> your big guy jokes are hilarious. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. <laughs> oh, speaking of material, what is the best bit you feel you have ever written and why? Um, I think... You just touched on it, the big uh-huh. guy stuff. Yeah. Because, you know, 
I try to get away from it. And I know people who've seen me before, they come back and ask me, can you do that big guy joke again? We just love that one. <laughs> I just can't take it out of my repertoire. They won't let me get rid of it. It's a signature yeah. bet. <laughs> it's a signature bet. Yeah. And then they laugh about my hat that I wear all the time. I and know. They just, and they just don't understand. This hat is a legacy. <laughs> my father left this hat to me. Oh, okay. Yeah. He went That's to work and left it sitting on the table. And I had it ever since. So <laughs> I know it's kind of part of your stage outfit, you know. Exactly. Every, time I, <laughs> every time I see you, I see you with your hat. It's great. Yeah. Yeah, it'll make an appearance here pretty soon in the Valley. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. Me and my hat. You and your hat. I'm so excited. I love that. I do. I, it's just, to me. I am a fan as well. <laughs> I, I hope so. I would say 23 years. You might have been a fan. <laughs> I just had a lot of debt, really. It just came down. I just, I didn't want to stop the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm a, I'm not a quitter. That's one thing. I can do. Yeah, Let's that's keep it going. Proven. That's right. Keep it going. It's a really interesting thing to me, though. My number one question is this: How do you go from serving in the army to doing stand-up comedy? How does this happen? <sighs> you know, those two things uh, go really well together. <laughs> Actually, uh, they're the same. Really, they're the same. That's all you do in the army. We just make jokes. Is all we do. No. I, I, I honestly, I, I wanted to be a comedian my whole life. I'm going to get serious fast. That's not good. I want to be a comedian my whole life. And I joined the army at 17. So I didn't ever have a chance to get into a club or anything because I was too, I was too young. Right. And then like, I had to have a note from my mom to join the army. That's not even a joke. Uh, wow. but yeah, it was, it's crazy. Like you, when you're 17, it's, it's a whole nother thing, but like, so I couldn't get in the clubs to try it. And, and then I just, you know, 23 years later, <laughs> I was still in, um, and I had retired. I was doing a job in DC and I, I, I walked into this coffee shop and saw a flyer that said, Hey, uh, you know, would you like to try stand up comedy? There's this free class for veterans called uh, armed services, arts partnership, comedy boot camp, And it's like, would you like to, you know, it's free for vets. And I was like, man, I would be, I'd been, here's the thing. I've been talking to my kid. My oldest was getting ready to go to college. And we were having these big talks about follow your dreams. Don't chase money, do what you want to do. And, and he knew I wanted to be a stand up comic. And I was just like, Hmm, if I don't do this, I'm the biggest hypocrite on the planet. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to try and see. And it was at the DC improv and it was just, it was awesome. And I fell in love with it. And ever since I've been, uh, <laughs> Doing it every chance I can. So, oh yeah. It's, luckily, I have 23 years of military material to draw from, uh, <laughs> which is good. good. That's a good bit. That's a good bit of material to draw from. How it's a that? lot. <laughs> it's a lot. You are right now also hosting the nationally syndicated show Cruise In on Fox uh, Sports. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? I said I'm a big shot. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're staying humble. We're staying humble. I get it. Well, what's that show all about, though? And how did you land that gig? The uh, I actually started talking about it on stage uh, because <laughs> it is kind of funny. And that the producer of the show and I were friends. Kind of, he was a subcontractor for a place I worked. And he would always, he had a host. The first host was great, but the first host got too busy. And then he would ask me for suggestions on someone to host and I was too busy. So it was just like understood. And finally I was like, why don't I just do it? And he's like, yeah, we'll fill it in whenever you come back to town. Cause it's in Ohio. Uh, but the funny thing is it's, you know, you think car show and you're like, oh man, I'm gonna go to the Detroit, Detroit car show, New York car show. Basically you go to, uh, parking lots in mostly in Ohio and Pennsylvania, those backyard park car shows where people just show up and they sit in lawn chairs in front of their cars and talk about them. Yeah. Sounds like the most stupid thing in the world. And it is so much fun. It's shockingly a good time. So I'm hanging out with grandpa in front of his 57 Packard. And uh, it's just like talking to a spokesmodel in front of a concept car. I really don't see the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's actually a lot of fun, though. And you see the weirdest stuff. My favorite one is because you there's all this just dream cars for when you were a kid. Everyone has a story. And this one guy had an 83 Yugo. And I'm like, oh, and I, you're probably too young to know what a Yugo is. But I don't both, even know. Yeah. Go to one of the 10 worst cars made at all time. But they still sold because you could get them for 4000 bucks. And my favorite thing is the guy's like, 
I wanted one. Uh, I couldn't afford it when they came out. And I'm like, it was four grand in like 83. It's <laughs> yeah. like trade in down payment. What's your monthly payment? Like a dollar fifty. So yeah, it's just actually really cool. You see all sorts of weird things and I'll talk about it on stage unless of course I forget. Yeah. Do you know a lot about cars? Is no. That- <laughs> a friend of mine, when he started watching it, he used to watch the show before I started hosting it. He goes, I love you hosting because when you ask questions, I can tell you have no idea. <laughs> like, What's happening? I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. As you have performed on cruise lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've done that. And I'm I'm curious. I'm sure the laughers are too. What is a typical schedule like for a comic that gets that kind of gig? How many shows are you doing and how long are you cruising? Yeah. yeah I mean, I guess it kind of depends on um, kind of the cruise line. I was spoiled and kind of got in with uh, Norwegian cruise line and uh, they, they, they pretty much spoil you from the, from the minute you, you start working with them till you keep going. They uh, typically fly you in somewhere the a day early. So you're usually going to like Miami or Seattle, or sometimes I've been flown up to like St. Thomas, you know, uh, out in the, on the Caribbean. Uh, and that's always cool. Cause then you got a day to just kind of walk around and kind of explore. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it typically depends on the, on the contract, you know, um, Typically, they try to keep it a uh, minimum of two weeks, um, but you know, obviously, there's there's longer contracts that go, you know, six six weeks or whatever. But just having the family and stuff, I try to keep it at about two or three weeks, just so I'm, you know, two two or three weeks away from the kids. It's a long time, so I try to find a nice balance. But um, yeah, typically, um, what you do is you you do anywhere between five to 190 shows. I mean, it all really kind of depends. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, especially these uh, transatlantic ones where they kind of they fly you overseas to Europe and then you kind of take the boat back to the U.S. There's a lot of uh, sea days. There's like four or five sea days. So sometimes uh, other acts can't go on, whether it's, uh, you know, just getting seasick or, you know, a lot of times there's like a uh, like a magic show where they're throwing knives, you know, so they don't really want people throwing knives when the sea's going crazy. So they cancel that. And then, you know, most of the times they put the comics on. So, but they're, they're all short sets. They're about a half hour long, which isn't too, too bad. Um, it's a nice little taste, but uh, every show is sort of like different because you got to do a different act in a theater show. And then, there, you know, you do a couple of club sets and you get a lot of repeat people, which is nice. You know, it seems like people really enjoy going to the comedy. So you always want to try to slip something new in just because you never know who's seen what. And uh, like I said, they, they take care of your travel and you know, obviously uh, being chubby, the best parts of the buffet. I love doing it. <laughs> hang out there the whole time. And, uh, but yeah, it's really, um, a a fun, uh, you know, like I said, I never thought I'd be a comedian, let alone traveling all over the world. So they definitely spoil you and, uh, you know, certainly, uh, don't take those trips for granted for sure. Do you have other hobbies besides, uh, the one time Rubik's cube adventure? (laughs) Uh, I I mean, I I like to run, I run a lot. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's where I, I don't know. I, that's, I, I run to get away from people. Uh, obviously <laughs> after being at work, I like to go home and then I like to go out by myself and run. Uh, I'll use that time. Like if I'm, if I'm trying to learn some new material, you know, I'll use that time then, or sometimes just to brainstorm new material or sometimes just to listen to music and just not do anything. But, uh, to run so what kind of music are you into um when i'm running i i i listen to um anything with a good good rhythm uh up very upbeat okay Very, very upbeat um so it's not the time to go emo or indie uh music for sure um i need something that's very energetic very energetic. Are you a long distance runner? You do marathons or 10 mm-hmm. days? Marathons. Yeah. Okay. Just go for the whole thing. Just, okay. Just, just, done just, done the Boston or anything gonna, cool like that? Uh, no, Boston, you have to be really fast to qualify for. So 
Thanks for reminding me that I'm not fast enough for boss. That's, that's nice. So how do you work as a comic? Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you like this. As I okay. tell all my friends and all my, you are considered my friend now. When you're dealing <laughs> hey. with me, you're dealing with a veteran. You're dealing with a disabled veteran. So govern yourself <laughs> according. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. All my friends know. Uh, Listen, when you're dealing with me, no, my memory is is not that good, and that's okay. from the military. It's from my PTSD. All my right. memory is not really that good. So what I do, I don't write out a whole joke. Okay, all throughout the week or all throughout my day, I am doing jokes in my mind because that's what I have to do. So I have a I have a set list, but I I just have one part of the word. So I know what that joke is and I will go over it and look at it. And that's the good part about not having a joke that's tailored because I have a joke. I have a couple of jokes that I can take to a comedy club. I can take to a church. I can take to a private function. I can take to a military organization. And I don't really have to change all the wording because that joke is meant to go anywhere. So that's why I try to write my jokes to where I can take them anywhere because I know my limitations in my in my uh in my mental illness. You know what I'm saying? Now I can improv and come off the top and stuff like that. I can do that, but I work to my strengths, not my limitations. Now that's pretty great. So you figured out how to work with your own challenges and limitations. Correct. That's really Correct. great. Oh, because I like that. Because when people pay you to do a show, they don't care about your limitations. They want you to be funny. Yeah, that's right. You know what I'm saying? So I can't, I can't come to you and say, oh, no, uh, you know I had a, a brain fart. No, no, you didn't. No, no. Give me my money back. Give me my money back. You won't fund it. You know, so. No, yeah. yeah. So I have to make sure I take it seriously when people spend or, or spend their harder money to come to see me or someone pays me to come. I make sure I study because this is my uh, full-time job. At Second City Art. Is there a wall of pictures of people that have come through this program? Can you talk about that a little bit and what it looks like? Maybe paint a visual for us that may not have seen it. Yes. So there are pictures all over Second City um, of different Second City alumni. Um, and it's pretty it's it's kind of amazing to see you know, people that you wouldn't have necessarily thought of them as a Second City alum, but that you see their picture and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize they they went here or they performed here. Um, now, all the pictures on the wall are, um, you know, people who have studied there, people who have performed there. So not necessarily people that did the specific program that um, I did. Um, although there are, are a ton of, like you said, A.D. Bryant, but also a ton of other notable alumni of people that are working out in LA. Um, there was one class where we were talking about, you know, like TikTok comedians, like famous TikTokers. And it like people rattled out a couple of names and our teacher, um, like Grace, um, I'm going to say her name wrong. Grace Kulenschmidt, um, big, sure. big on TikTok. Okay. Um, but, um, yeah, and one of our teachers was like, oh, she she was a com comedy studies alumni. And I, that was somebody I didn't even think of would be um, who would have gone through the program. So that was pretty cool. Um, but I mean, just in terms of Second City in general, they have a ton of um, different education programs um, and they've housed a ton of performers just through their um, main stage shows and touring company shows so i mean on the wall there's um tim robinson tina fey amy poehler um stephen colbert i mean like so honestly there's a there's a room that has pictures all, oh. wrapping all the way around and then and you will go in and immediately say oh there's Catherine o'hara you know, I'm sure it's pretty. there's, you know, and, and oh, there will be some, there's some people that I don't recognize. And there's some people that I'm like, Oh, I know them from this. <laughs> um, so that was really, really cool. And, and a good reminder while you're sitting, eating lunch and thinking like, Oh, I, how am I ever going to write this sketch? And you see all the pictures up on the wall. 
So it's like kind of like, oh, this is this is why I'm here. Because <laughs> <laughs> you are an actor and you've been in a bunch of TV shows and, yeah. and a host of short stories, indie films, Geico and True Green commercials and mm -hmm. then other projects that you shot during the pandemic. And those are yeah. I'm really curious about what are some of the projects you did during the pandemic? So I've done I've done a lot of random commercials and um, things for like car dealerships. Um, there's this place called Dealer On. I did for them. And I mean, the list goes on as far as short films and stuff. Um, but when it comes to commercials, I've had the most fun doing these videos where I consistently get booked to do these video games commercials you know like when you're on your cell phone playing a video game somebody pops up it's like hey i just want this amount of money da, 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 da. yeah yeah i'm one of those people <laughs> like <laughs> i've booked several of those things and i mean i have so much fun doing them because they want you to be as silly as possible or as noticeable as possible and you get to film them at home and those things are cool and then i do these testimonials uh for companies and the the funniest one i've done was for hymns do you know what hymns have you ever heard of a company called hymns no i don't think so all right. So there's a hymns and there's a hers. OK, funny with the pronouns. Um, so there's a hymns. Right. OK. <laughs> and, and what it is, is it's appeal for for males who have um, E.D. Oh, OK. Oh, All yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. See, this now is PG-13. <laughs> so everyone, let's right, just so give you a minute. If you don't minute. know what that is, then you're, uh, Google. You're, Google. No, don't tell them to Google. It's going to be a 14 year old who's oh. going to be on here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you have been referred to or are referred to as the black redneck woman. How in the world did you get deemed this? All my life, since I was a little girl, as I said earlier, I love country music. I would see it, I would play it. Or we had a uh, back, I remember my daddy bought me my first, not the little transistor radio, but the first little big old square rest, uh, radio with the antenna. And I would lay in the bed at night listening to, uh, what is it, Ernest Reckermont out of Tennessee. And they played country all day and stuff. And then at night they would play gospel, you know. But anyway, I loved uh, Loretta Lynn. Oh my God. Oh, and, yeah. and I could sing those songs, honey. <laughs> oh, what you talking about? And uh, I, just, I just grew, I love the lyrics. I just grew up loving country music. And my daddy did. He had a, uh, a record a record by uh, Hank Williams Sr. Oh, my goodness. And I remember daddy playing that music and just, just loving it. We were country. We didn't backwards in the country. And so everybody would say, oh, you saying country music, you saying country music. Well, I don't say I want to say my country. So at talent shows and everything in school, I was singing country music. And be, it got to the point they enjoyed me singing the country music. So oh, when I started great. doing it, in, I used to do it on the stage in comedy. <laughs> I, would, I would end up singing something. And I tell you, uh, uh, um, uh, Redneck Woman, would Redneck Woman come out? I'm just, yeah. just in that one. Oh, I started singing that song. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what that some of them deemed me the black redneck woman. And it and stuck. I, I love it. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, I love it. I love it. I still like it. Uh -huh. But uh, there yeah, I, I did. I had so much fun. And when we would do uh, karaoke, I would do the country songs. And then my, some of the people would be like, oh, I can't believe she's singing. Well, then the next thing you know, a little while later, they'd be enjoying it. They were never introduced. They never listened to the songs. You know, it's 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 weird, but true. People don't pay attention to the lyrics. They always pay attention to the beat. Yeah. Oh, that's my song. What's the words? I don't know, but that's my song. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But with country, you gotta listen to the. You listen to the lyrics, and don't worry about the beat. They used to say that twang, country twang. And no, I always listen to the lyrics, deep into lyrics, you know. And so those country songs for me just had the, the this told stories. So anyway, and I still like, I, I love it. Matter of fact, I love country music. He still love Gretchen it. Gretchen Wilson was my girl on that, Gretchen. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite country song, or maybe a couple of your favorite country songs of all time? I'll tell you, uh, it's not... Um, 
And I must tell you, I'm in love with Toby Keith. I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I'm a man Toby it. Keith. He don't even know me, but I'm going to marry Toby Keith. I'm still going to marry him. I've been, I've been going to marry him for 35 years. <laughs> when we haven't even met. You've been at this now over 20 years, Lachlan, and you're a bit of a storyteller. I'm curious, <laughs> what's the most unique place you've performed so far? That is, of course, until the caves this summer in the valley, a week before your birthday, just saying. But that's right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> so. I mean, caves, caves, caves got to be the weirdest. <laughs> caves got to be the weirdest. Uh, I had performed, I'm sure I performed in, I mean, during the pandemic, I performed in, you know, everyone was trying to turn something into one. I performed in a, uh, an Airstream trailer. Oh. Uh, probably a month ago. Okay. This guy actually took an Airstream trailer and turned it into a comedy stage. Um, I performed on t- a tugboat once. I remember okay. performing on a tugboat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean up in Nova Scotia. I think it was a tugboat. Um, a lot of a lot of barbecues and parking lots and um, people's houses. I performed in a lot of living rooms, staircases. I did a show on a staircase to it, to a people below sitting in the living room. I mean, God, it's just, it's so, it's good for me though. You know, you want to be good at, good at everything, I guess. So, you know, it's, you gotta know how to entertain a, a living room as well as an arena. Uh, but, but caves fun cave. I like the low ceilings. It's a, it's a good, that's a good measurement of a, of a comedy show. Lower ceilings is better always for comedy. The the lower the ceiling, the better, like, like, yeah, like a bottom floor of a pirate ship would be (laughs) perfect, be a perfect venue. And I've been told I have a, I'm like a mild sedative. Yes, I know. <laughs> very calm. I love it. And creative. You also have a coffee table book based on your dark white special. What's in it? What comes with it? And if the laughers wanted to purchase it, where can they get it? Thank, thank you. <laughs> um, I did. Yes. Um, during the pandemic, um, I, I came up with this idea for a coffee table book. and. I had a couple of friends who are also out of not working. One of which uh, was a photographer who named Matt Masisco, who's an amazing photographer. And so he wasn't really having much success with the social distance photography. And so he, uh, I convinced him to help me and I convinced my buddy, Josh Davis, who is a lighting and grip for movies and the movie business had taken a break. So, and he lights like, like Jurassic parks, Tarantino films and Marvel. And so he's, he had all this equipment too. And he's like, I, I have a lot of equipment. Maybe I can help. And, uh, we had, uh, I had been inspired by this artist named Gregory Crudson, who takes living pictures there. He takes these stunning pictures of a, of scenes, um, you got to check them out if you can, but I'd love to. It's called Tableau Vivant, which means living picture. And he essentially puts people in the picture and, and lights up certain areas, almost like a set for a movie. And he cool. snaps a photo. Yes. It's ominous. And he creates this life and you really does. He doesn't tell you what's going on in the photo. You just kind of have to imagine based upon what he's put together, what's going on. And so we tried to recreate that only through my stand-up comedy. So we would take my jokes and we'd go, okay, well, okay. This joke about, oh, I, I have a joke about the tandem bicycle and how dangerous it is. Yep. And so we were trying to recreate that. So we, we got a tandem bicycle and we got, you know, it took us forever to find a tandem bicycle in a sunny day. <laughs> and uh, uh, we tried to shoot the shot where neither of us on the bicycle, me and the other actor on the bicycle aren't paying attention. And there's a giant manhole 
open in front of us. So we, you know, we figured it out. We figured out how to do that. It took all day to set it up and shoot it. And, um, we put, we, we went through my entire comedy album and took photos that went with all the jokes and then put it all together in a coffee table book. And the cool thing about it is, uh, I set it up. I designed the book to go with the album. So when you listen to the album, it corresponds and you turn the pages as you're listening to the album. And I even added in uh, a sound effect that lets you know when to turn the page. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you can just listen to the joke, see the photo. And then when it tells you to turn the page, you flip. And then I've transcribed the entire, everything I'm saying, I've transcribed on one side of the page. And then on the other side of the page is a photo that goes with everything. So you can read it, you can listen to it, or you can look in it, or you can do all three. And um, I have them available only on my website at LachlanPatterson.com. And I ship them all over America and Canada and wherever you want. I like the way you said America. <laughs> America. Great. America. Canada. I even said Canada with an American accent. Canada. Yeah, Canada. <laughs> you have been on a couple of TV shows. So I wanted to ask you what your experiences were like performing on HBO Deaf Comedy Jam and BET's Comic View. What was that like for you? Wow, man. For me, being as young as I was in you know, just having a dream of doing something like that recent to actually be somewhere where it's like, wow, I'm actually on the set of the place where I've been watching people do this craft for years. It's like, wow, man, I'm actually here. It was, it was surreal to me. It was surreal. I think I was I walked around in the days for like the first day, but I had to get myself together because I had to perform. I was like, I got to get my mind, my, 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 my set together because Def Jam was Ooh, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't no, it was no joke. Because remember, it was always, this is what people didn't know, that there was always like five comments and tape for the show that you're actually seeing, but somebody don't make it. And that's wow. always, yeah, based on, you know, people got booed off the stage and all that. And it's like, okay, well, they won't show that. Now, when I would, they had like five great comics that did five great sets, then they would probably edit one of the sets into another show somewhere where it was a whole the gap, but yeah, so it was rough. So it was exciting. So I said, I got to get my set together. Who <laughs> be right. But it was, it was awesome. Just being there and then seeing the lights in New York it was my first time in New York. And I, we had to walk across like, you know, the, uh, the, squ- uh, the, the, um, the square. And it was like, you know, like all the lights and stuff. And it was like, wow, this is wild. I mean, we had our own driver come pick us up from the airport. It was like, this is a glimpse of how it could be. I made it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long was your set on uh, Def Comedy Jam? How I mean, long is it set? Like about seven minutes. Okay. So nice, Def tight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow, so, I, I didn't think about that. You took me back. <laughs> you took me back. Hey, Dom, thanks for having me in the valley. Wham, <laughs> wham, wham, wham. <laughs> 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 just imagine that we got on. <sighs> <sighs> Yeah, that's right. That's what we do, Shevitz. That's what we do here. Yes. And we do it because we bring in hilarious comedians who are uber talented like yourself. So this is your first X2 comedy show with us. That's a lot of pressure. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) (laughs) Say that one more time. Make sure sure that was me. Oh, my God. (laughs) It is you, my friend. It is you. I'm so stoked. Our like past cross. We have a mutual friend. We're going to talk about that. But I I want to talk about first the start in comedy 1996 at the Comedy Connection of Langley Park, Maryland. Tell us the story and how did it go? What got you on the stage? I need to know. Um, well, you know, I was, it was an old cliche where people was like, you know, you're funny, you know, you should do comedy, you should do comedy, you know, and I kept 
saying I want to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But I was scared, to be honest with you. You know what I'm saying? And you might see me now and be like, I can't believe you was ever scared. Terrified. So my friends took me to a comedy club one night, not knowing that they had already signed me up. You know, you're supposed to have a certain amount of people to even be on the contest. So it was like, you know, they planned it all out. We all going to go and go to this comedy contest just so you could look at it, but didn't know they signed me up. And they was my eight guests for me to be on a competition. And they called my name and I wasn't going to go up. I was not going to go up in the host Monica Majesty um, at the Comedy Connection, Langley Park. She said my name again. Of course, she didn't say it right. You know, because <laughs> when you see my day the first time, you don't think that that lineup of letters says Chef and Switcher. Yeah. So, you know, but like you say, Quichard is Quichard. Oh, see, even I'm yeah. messing up. I know, people always try to jazz it up as if it's not jazzy enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I got on it, I got on the stage and I just spent most of my time just, you know, fussing at them, you know, for doing that. And everybody was just laughing. They could, and I was really really in my feelings because I'm like, you know, now y'all gonna mess me up for when I really decide I want to do it. And people are laughing and they just (laughs) thought it was a bit in the routine. And so the next time I went for the actual contest, which was the next week, you know, I did pretty good. And they told me to go to the Def Jam semifinals did sign me up and it was just going, going, going. And I just kept winning and I was, it was more amazing and scary at the same time because I'm like, you know, I'm, I, I'm not supposed to be here. You know, <laughs> this is my fourth time on stage and I'm on at the finals <laughs> for Def Comedy Jam taping. You know, I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> you actually have somewhat of a technical debut on a podcast from a song that you wrote that was <laughs> <All right. laughs> The Office. That's my favorite in sitcom ever. <laughs> All right. And it was picked by the popular Office Ladies podcast. Now, these podcast hosts were co stars on the hit series The Office Star. Steve Carell, and now besties Jenna Fisher, who played Pam Beasley, and Angela, who played Angela Martin at Dunder Mifflin, are doing the Ultimate Rewatch podcast. They break down an episode of The Office, giving exclusive behind-the-scenes stories. I have got to hear how in the world... You got the song selected, and what was your writing process behind this song? Well, uh, you know, you gave me the great lead in for the sitcom on the office and I blew it on. So I'm sorry. But anyway, so they, right, they were going through, you know, every episode and they got up to the episode, which is when Jim first comes back from uh, uh, Connecticut and he has the, he has the girlfriend and Pam hasn't quite sussed it out yet. And so there's a scene where they're in, in the, in the break room and, uh, the, the two of them started joking around and they said, somebody should write a song about heartbreak in the break room. And uh, it needs to have these elements, mama's sexy sweater and <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. And I thought, oh, I'm going to write a song and send it to them. But I, I logged onto the website about a week later and they'd already put up, people had already been contacting them about that. So as far as my process, I, ha- I have zero, pro- at all, the comedy, the writing, the best of it happens unconsciously and it just comes out and I don't know what, what the process is. I have a, I, I did a blue, she had mentioned that she liked bluegrass, the people thought she didn't so i did a, a bluegrass version of it and i just used the elements from the song and uh, and i made a video that's on my instagram account and sent it in and they were playing other people's songs that weren't as good and i was i was getting really like upset you know first time my ego was hurt <laughs> like, i thought that was funny then i'm like well i guess i'm not not as funny as i thought i was <laughs> i can live with that <laughs> and I actually stopped stopped listening to to the show because I was kind of you know uh, feeling a little bit upset about it, and uh, then then some uh, people started calling me up like, "Well, we heard you show up on the Office Ladies podcast," and I started getting emails from people I didn't know, and they had, that's apparently a, a, a is or was a very popular show, and so they uh, they uh, they had played it uh, right at the end. They got to the end and they said, "Oh, by the way, here's you know this song was submitted by Jay Zare from Harrisonburg, and thanks so much, Jay," and, and they played it at the end of. Of a, of a podcast as opposed to just putting it on the Instagram account. So it was, pretty, it was pretty, not a major accomplishment, but it was cute. It is cute. How long did it take you to write the song? Was it, you said not it long. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, I only, it was only a couple minutes at, at, at most. It took me not long at all. It took me longer to record it. Cause I, I used, 
I recorded three parts and then I did a video with me singing and two be two versions of me backing me up. So, uh, with some psychedelic stuff in there. So it was, uh, it, 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 I don't, I don't have, I have zero knowledge of, of my uh, creative process. It happens unconsciously for oh. the most part. Yeah. Speaking of comedy, you were actually literally raised by a couple of clowns. Both your mom, <laughs> <laughs> for real, both your mom and dad were professional clowns. What was it like growing up with them? It was funny. You know, my, uh, well, my dad always told me, you know, he's like, don't box yourself in. Don't don't think all you can do is one thing because in the end, that's all you have is that one thing. And, and he's like, don't do what everybody else does. You know, he definitely was somebody who went, went against the grain himself. I mean, he was a cop, a clown and a Christian. That is just an amazing trifecta, you know, yeah. especially nowadays. A lot of people like to run away from cops, clowns and Christians, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> he, he definitely practiced what he preached. And, and uh, I was inspired by my dad because he wasn't just some creepy person who put on the makeup. He actually was really funny. Like when I was a kid, I would watch him perform and he would come in the back of the room and he had like a loud kind of kiddish type voice it was funny and the kids just exploded in laughter and just the energy and I, I i watched my dad do that and just recently i was at the circus world museum in baraboo wisconsin and i was walking through the clown house and i looked up and there's a picture of my mom and dad on the circus wagon in 1984 my both of my parents are enshrined in the circus world museum so it's really it's actually, I, you know, but it's weird because people are like, oh, I hate clowns. I'm terrified of clowns. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, but I mean, I, 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 I'm thankful for the experiences that my father showed me that not, not everything has to be dirty. Not everything has to be filthy. Not everything has to be scary. You know, cops aren't supposed to beat you. They're supposed to protect and Christians aren't supposed to judge you. They're supposed to love and, and clowns aren't supposed to scare you. They're supposed to make you laugh. So he told me, you know, there's always going to be that hacky person who puts the makeup on spends all that time and then walks around and uses the regular voice you want a hug you're, you're scared <laughs> of weirdos okay yeah. but, if we're, but if the guy did it the right way and, and actually was really funny and and used the skill sets of clowning you know i mean gosh there's so many clowns that are american treasures like red skeleton was a clown and Charlie Chaplin was a clown and Carrot Top is a clown. You know, they just don't wear makeup, you know, but they do what's called clowning. So. How did you find out about the Circus World Museum? Did your parents tell you about that? And do you know? Yeah, my, yeah oh, yeah, of course, you know, yeah. and it wasn't too far from where I grew up, you know, so. And they, 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 they really struggled in the pandemic. And so the state of Wisconsin bought the circus world. And so now they can never go out of business. And so it's just really cool to know that my parents are in that museum. So it's really, really cool. You tell people that it's hard to feel sympathy for telling people that you're going to deploy to the Bahamas. Nobody thinks everyone thinks you're going on vacation, but it, it was a little bit like, uh, <laughs> it was a little bit of a, a, a struggling trip. And then you battle giant mosquitoes the whole time you're there too. That's, that's the other part of it. That's the real enemy. <laughs> yeah, it's the real enemy. Yeah. Worst enemy I've ever faced, for sure. <laughs> I've been to the Bahamas. It's been a long time. I went as a kid. It was really a lot of fun. And yeah. we, we went to restaurants for dinner. So. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't have those. Uh, it didn't sound like it. <laughs> No, it sounds like a totally different experience. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for your service and I'm also you. you're welcome and I'm also so curious after 11 years in the Coast Guard what prompted you then to go from flying the helicopters to doing stand-up yeah uh stand-up was something I was always interested in uh that was one of those things like when I was I remember as a kid you know like watching stand-up watching Comedy Central that was a thing in my head I was like I would love to do that. Like that would be the dream, but it was also one of those things I never told anybody. Cause I was like, that's crazy. You can't just do that. <laughs> <laughs> that that's very silly. Um, but I started, uh, I had like very busy, like, like with flight school and everything 
it, it was just a really busy time until like my mid twenties, I started to finally like calm down a little bit. And I started getting those pings again about like wanting to try it. So I finally tried it, uh, in, um, man, I think that was 2016. The first time I went up and, uh, I, uh, yeah, I just, I just really liked it. And I, I, it sort of coincided with the, uh, me starting to get out of the Coast Guard. And so I knew like, uh, I would be getting out of the Coast Guard a few years from that point. And, uh, and so I essentially just tried it as much as I could, um, until I got out last summer. And by that point I was like, well, I'm ready to give this thing a shot and see what I can do if I, uh, put all my energy into it. Um, but yeah, I mean, to start, it was really just a, a curiosity and a passion. And I just kind of, you know, so I said, see where this takes me basically. Thanks for supporting and celebrating a hundred episodes with us. We're sincerely grateful for your ongoing support. You're a rock star. Speaking of rock stars, I want to give a huge shout out to our first sponsor, Pre Popster is Gourmet Popcorn. Tisha is wonderful and so are their Kernel Creations. They use handcrafted recipes to satisfy all your sweet and savory cravings. We're super excited to partner with her so you can get your discount. Be sure to visit prepopsterous.com. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S.com and use promo code LAUGH15. Then to schedule your ab workouts, you might want afterwards, see our comedians perform live. Visit x2comedy.com to snag some tickets to an upcoming show today. And lastly, and most importantly, Thanks for tuning in, laughers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us, and we think that's pretty darn special, just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring one to you. To find out more, head to X2Comedy.com. Be sure to share this podcast with a friend. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.